Good evening once again, and I'm very delighted to be sharing once again with you all. And we are going to get into the prophetic portions of the book of Daniel. On Daniel chapter 1 to 6, it talks primarily about the historical section of you know how how the life of Daniel was in, in Babylon and also partly in Middle Persia. Uh, except for Daniel chapter 2, where uh, history and prophecy was combined, where there's more of Daniel's story of how what things happen, but there was also this foundational prophecy there. But from now onwards, from chapter 7 through 12, we are going to get into the historical sections of the book of Daniel. We won't be, there won't be any stories of, you know, Daniel being thrown in the lion's den or, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. But this uh, section, the hist prophetic portions, speaks to our time, and it is very, very important that we understand them. And so let's pray and let's get started. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time where we could come and study your word and father i pray that you would give us your holy spirit the holy spirit who gave the gift of prophecy uh, to the prophets i pray father that that same spirit would come and help us to understand the prophecies that you have given to us father um we are going to get into subjects which the devil does not want us to understand but i pray father that you would withstand the forces of evil and that your truth may be proclaimed and triumphed in each one of our lives and and so god i pray that you would be with us help us to concentrate and um, listen to uh, your words in jesus name we pray amen okay. before we get into daniel chapter 7 there is uh, one uh, one interpretive tool that I want that I want to uh, uh, help us that I want us to understand, we, uh, which will help us to understand all the prophecies that we are going to be looking later. This tool is called recapitulation, or otherwise called as repeat and enlarge. And what uh, this tool, what uh, repeat and enlarge means, is that the author of a particular book what they do is they repeatedly lead their listeners and uh, readers over the same ground adding a new perspective each time what it's what it means is that the prophets sometimes they repeat the information obviously it comes from god but they repeat the information with uh, by adding new details and insights and new perspective each time with uh, every repetition, and what that does is, uh, when you know, repetition make repetition makes a deeper impression. But also adding new details help us to understand, uh, understand it clearly. In fact, uh, you 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 are going to find out that as we go through other major prophecies, you know, in Daniel chapter eight and verse uh, Daniel chapter eight and chapter eleven, you'll find that we'll be covering the same historical portions but with each prophecy there's more uh, there's added uh, emphasis and there's more um, how, more uh, insight uh, to to each of those prophecies and let me give you an example of what this repeat and enlarges you know in Dan, uh, Genesis chapter 1 in Genesis chapter 1 you you'll find the creation week you know God created a uh, God created on the first six days and he rested on the seventh day on the Sabbath. If you look at the sixth day in, uh, in particular, it tells us, you know, God tells, let us make man in our own image. And so God says, let us make man. But how did he make man? That is not revealed in Genesis chapter one. But when you go and read Genesis chapter two, it enlarges, it repeats, but it also enlarges on what happened on the sixth day. There you'll find that, you know, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life and man became a living soul. And then God puts Adam to sleep and then he takes uh, the rib out of Adam and makes the woman and he calls her Eve. And so what do you find there is, uh, is Moses repeating the same information, but enlarges it, adding a newer pers perspective to it. And today, uh, this prophecy that we are going to look at in Daniel chapter 7 is it builds on the prophecy we saw in Daniel chapter 2 a couple of weeks back when John covered it. And so before we get into Daniel 7, I want to review what we saw in Daniel chapter 2. 
here we see the king going to bed and he had dreams and his spirit was troubled. Therefore, he calls his magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and the wise men, wisest men in Babylon in his kingdom to come and tell him the dream and the interpretation, but they could not. And so the king is furious and he makes an order for all of the wise men to be killed. And while the soldiers, they come to kill Daniel and his friends because they were also considered the wise men of Babylon, Daniel inquires what happens and, you know, why is the king's decree so urgent? And then the king's captain tells him what happened, all that happened. And so Daniel asks for some time. He goes and he prays with his friends and God reveals to Daniel both the dream and the interpretation. And therefore Daniel comes back and he tells that uh, the reason why God gave him the dream. The king was worried as to what would happen to his kingdom after he dies and God makes and God wants to make known to the king what will come to pass and so we find the dream in Daniel chapter 2 verses 31 through 35 and the interpretation in 36 through 45 we, we don't have time to go and read through all of it but the summary of it was you know in the dream the king sees this head of gold chest and arms of silver belly and thighs of brass legs of iron feet of iron and clay and a stone cut out without hands what was the interpretation of the dream the head of gold represented babylon and chest and arms of silver represented medo persia belly and thighs of brass represented greece legs of iron represented rome feet of iron and clay represented divided rome or divided europe and the stone cut out without hands represents king the kingdom of god which will last forever this prophecy in daniel chapter 2 serves as the foundation for all other prophecies in the book of daniel and even for revelation and so let, with this in mind let us go to daniel chapter 7 daniel chapter 7 and verse 1 daniel chapter 7 and verse 1 it reads, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. And so Daniel gets this vision even before Daniel 5 and 6 because he gets this vision in the first year of King Belshazzar. But, but Daniel 7 is placed after these chapters, after chapter 5 and 6, uh, even though chronologically this happened before the fall of Babylon. But Daniel places it here because uh, there is this clear division based on, the, based on the historical and prophetic sections. So what was the first year of uh, Belshazzar? It was about 533 to 532 BC. That was the first year of Belshazzar. And this vision comes to Daniel in the first year of Belshazzar because you see, Belshazzar is going to be the last king of Babylon. We saw in Daniel chapter 5 how the Babylonians or the Medo Persians came and conquered Babylon while Belshazzar was feasting. And so he was going to be the last king of Babylon. Babylon, this great empire, is going to lose its glory. Therefore, God revealed to his prophet what will happen. So in his dreams, Daniel sees the four beasts and he writes down the summary of his dream. Verses 2 and 3. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from, uh, diverse from another. And so Daniel sees here, there are these four great beasts that come up out of the sea and they are different from one another. Now, this is rather an unusual picture. You do not see, for example, uh, you know, there's this lion with eagle's wings. There is this bear. There is, there is this leopard with four wings. Those are not normal creatures. Those are not literal beasts. So what we see here is that Daniel, in, in Bible prophecy, God has coded these, um, coded the history with symbols, with symbols for us to understand. Now, but when you think of these symbols, you do not have to go and guess 
what those symbols mean, the Bible itself reveals to us the answers. For example, in Daniel chapter 2 and 3, there are three symbols that you find. First, there is this, uh, he sees in the vision, there are these four winds of heaven that strove upon the great sea, and then four beasts come up. There are three symbols here that we find. So what are the four winds of heaven that strove upon the great sea? What do winds represent in the Bible? The winds represent strife, warfare, and bloodshed in the Bible. You can write down these references, Jeremiah 49, verses 36 and 37, chapter 25, verses 32 and 33, and uh, chapter 4, verses 11, 11 through 13. In fact, let's read Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. It says, and that time shall it be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of high places, high places in the wilderness towards the daughter of my people, not to fan, not to cleanse, even a full wind from those places shall come unto me. Now also will I give sentence against them. Behold, he shall come up as clouds and his chariot shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter, swifter than eagles, Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. Here you see how the winds represent strife and warfare. The wind will blow, not to fan or to cleanse, but it will come as a sentence against them, against Jerusalem. The Babylonian armies are here referred to as winds in this particular context. This wind was a sentence against them because of war and bloodshed. Jerusalem lost and Babylon won. So in so winds in Bible prophecy, it represents wars and bloodshed. What does sea represent in the Bible? Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15 gives us the answer. It says, and he said unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the war sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the waters, it represents the people, multitude, nations, and tongues. And what is the third symbol that we see uh, uh, in verse 3? It says, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. So what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? We do not have to guess. Verses 17 and 23 gives us the answer. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. In fact, verse 23 says, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So what have we seen, seen so far? There are four kingdoms that come up out of strife and warfare among nations and peoples. Now, one thing you, you ought to notice here is that these beasts don't come up at the same time time because when you read verses 6 and 7 verse 6 it says after this i beheld and lo another beast you know it comes up verse 7 after this i saw in an in the night visions and behold another uh, behold a fourth beast and so when you read verses 6 and 7 it tells that after this i looked and another beast came up the word after denotes sequential order and so the winds of daniel which strove upon the great sea causing four beasts or empires to emerge represented those movements that diplomatic war like political or otherwise you know they were to shape the history of the period these four winds represents wars from the four quarters of the earth and as a result of war among sea which represents nations and peoples four great beasts four great empires came up. And so now let's look at what those empires were. Verse four, it says, the first was like a lion and it had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made, and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. What does the lion represent? And again, we do not have to guess because if you go to Jeremiah chapter 50, verses 43 and 44, Jeremiah chapter, uh, Jeremiah chapter 
uh, 50 verses 43 and 44. It says, the king of Babylon hath heard the report of them and his hands wa and his hands waxed feeble, anguish took hold of him and pangs as of a woman in travel. And behold, he shall come up like a lion from the swelling of Jordan unto the habitation of the strong. But you see, what does uh, Babylon, what does God, which animal does God use uh, to represent Babylon, he uses lion. He uses lion. Bible prof, the biblical prophets, they tell us who the lion is. Jeremiah talking about the king of Babylon, he says he will come up like a lion. The lion represents the king or the kingdom of Babylon. Now, one author writes, a lion was particularly an apt symbol to represent Babylon. Lions were depicted on the walls of Babylon's Ishtar gate and on the outer wall of the audience chamber of the king's palace. A statue of an immense lion stood in the courtyard of the palace. In the mythology of Babylon, these lions were thought of as carrying the goddess Ishtar on their bags. And so lion, it represents Babylon in this context. Now, what do the eagle's wings represent? If you read Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, here the Chaldeans and their conquests is referred to as an hung, hungry, hungry eagle. And so the wings here, it represents the rapidity of their conquest. You see in Daniel chapter 2, in the dream of the statue, gold, the precious metal, was used to represent Babylon. In this dream, lion, the king of the beasts, and eagle, the king of the birds, are being used to depict Babylon. What does this show? It represents Babylon at, it, at the height of its glory. Its empire was vast. Just as the eagle leaves its house to go to other places to fight its prey, Babylon's empire was vast. They often travel far and wide for their conquests. Uh, you know, a lion is noted for its strength. Whereas the eagle is famous for the power and the range of its flight. Nebuchadnezzar's power was felt not only in Babylon, but from the Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf and from Asia Minor to Egypt. Thus, it is a fitting, thus it is fitting in order to rep uh, represent the spread of Babylon's power that the lion should be provided with eagle's wings. But the prophecy tells us that this would change. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 3, it tells us that the wings were plucked off. The wings being plucked off could possibly represent the decline of the intensity of their conquests. The kings after Nebuchadnezzar were weak and, the, and they did not engage in much conquest. Rather, they were losing much of their uh, much of their political uh, kingdom, much of their land. And it was, and it says it was made to stand up on the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. This is yet another symbolism to show how Babylon lost its lion-hearted bravery and was weak and powerless as a man. And you see compared to lion, a man, man is very weak. And so man's heart being given to, ba uh, to a lion shows that Babylon became weak, weaker towards its closing stages. It, it could also represent how King Nebuchadnezzar was humiliated and, and a man's heart, his heart was being changed. Babylon ruled from 612 BC, defeating the Assyrians at Nineveh to 539 BC when they were conquered. Who conquered Babylon? Uh, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 5. It says, And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. This beer kingdom, uh, uh, what was this kingdom that overcame Babylon? Again, the Bible uh, uh, tells us if you, you know, we uh, last week we went over Daniel chapter 5 we, and we saw the history of the fall of Babylon as they were parting a finger of a man's hand writes on the walls of the king's palace. They call Daniel to interpret it. He comes and tells them what was written and what it meant. And when you read Daniel chapter 5 and verse 8, 
uh, upharsan, it means the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And this is exactly what happened. And so what we see here is that we uh, what we see here is that after Babylon, the next kingdom that came that is represented here as a bear, it represents the uh, this uh, United Kingdoms of Media and Persia. And what does it mean when the Bible says it was raised up on one side? This talks about the power imbalance between the Medes and the Persians. The Medes were stronger at the beginning, but the Persians became stronger towards the end of their rule. The three ribs, the three ribs, uh, ribs could represent three nations that the Medes and the Persians conquered to become a then known world power. And these three kingdoms are Lydia in 547 BC, Babylon in 539 BC, and Egypt in 525 BC. But the Persians were not to rule forever because the Persians were overcome in 331 BC. If you read, uh, and we will read it, Daniel chapter seven and verse six, it says, after this, I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads and dominion was given to it. What kingdom overcame the Medes and the Persians? We do not have to guess because the Bible mentions by name almost 300 years before the event even happened. If you go to Daniel chapter 8, next week John will cover Daniel chapter 8 in detail. But if you read verses 20 and 21, it says here it is represented by a different uh, uh, animal. But here it says the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Almost 300 years before this event happened, Bible predicts that after the Med Medes and the Persians, the kingdom of Greece would rule and the great horn there it who is which is the first king it refers to Alexander the Great because he was the first king of Hellenistic Greece and so what we see here is that after this uh, bear there comes this leopard which had four wings what do the four wings represent here we saw in um, we saw it in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 3, this lion had eagle's wings. And we saw how uh, wings, it represents the uh, rapidity of the conquests. Well, here, the leopard, it has four wings. Although leopard itself is a swift creature, we see four wings added to it to accurately describe the superpower of Alexander and his rapid conquests around the world. The leopard is swift, but it was swifter with the four wings. Alexander the Great conquered the whole Near East from Egypt to the Indus Valley in India in just three years. Nebuchadnezzar took 13 years to reach a stalemate with the kingdom of Tyre, whereas in contrast, Alexander conquered Tyre in just eight months. No, by comparison, it took the Assyrians three years to conquer Samaria and the Babylonians three years to conquer Jerusalem. Yet in that same amount of time, Alexander conquered the whole of the ancient Near East from Egypt to the Indus Valley of, uh, Indus Valley of India. So in his 15 years of leading the army, Alexander, he never lost a battle from his first victory at the age of 18 till his death. He never lost a battle and his military tactics and strategies are studied in military academies even today. His, and he had plans to conquer Arabia, but he didn't live to see it because at the age of 32 in 323 BC, uh, he died and some think he died of malaria and others think that he was poisoned. But after him, we see that the beast had four heads. What do these four heads represent? It represents the four generals that divided his kingdom. While when he was asked who would succeed him, Alexander said the strongest, which 
uh, which answers uh, which led to his empire being divided between his four gel, uh, generals and because of the fragmentation the kingdom became weak and it eventually was subdued in 168 bc what happens next what happens next in this um, battle for power? Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, it says, After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom three there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. Now, before we go any further, I want to propose that the fourth beast and its subsequent stages from uh, form one of the most important parts of this chapter. Going by the volume of verses, you will find that verse 7 and 8, verses 19 through 21, and verses 23 through 25, it talks about this fourth beast, this great and dreadful beast, uh, and its subsequent stages. So it is very important for us to focus on this passage. It is very important for us to try to understand this because Daniel was, if you read the entire chapter, you'll find that, you know, after this vision, uh, Daniel is troubled. And so he asks for interpretation and the angel gives him a brief interpretation. And Daniel again asks about this fourth beast, because as you read in just verses seven and eight, this beast is completely different from the other beasts. And so it is very important for us to focus on this passage. Daniel sees a fourth beast. So far, Daniel was able to compare, you know, a beast with an animal like a lion, like a bear, like a leopard, but he is not able to compare this beast that he sees in vision with any beasts that we know. He just tells this fourth beast was dreadful and terrible, and it was strong exceedingly. The kingdom that overthrew the divided Greece was Rome. In fact, Rome was uh, referred to as the iron monarchy. And if you see, it says it had great iron teeth. And Daniel chapter 2 the kingdom of Rome wa was represented as legs of iron. And so it is very interesting to how it is denoted as ha having iron teeth. The space and the adjective adjective that is used to describe it is un incomparable to the other beasts. For example, look at the descriptions that you find. It says this beast was dreadful. It was terrible. It was strong exceedingly. It devoured and broke in pieces and it stamped the residue with the feet of it. In fact, the repeated phraseology of this verse shows the brutality of this kingdom in dealing with their subjects. They were ruthless in their conquest and were thorough in wiping out their enemies. In fact, I want to read one example of it. It is from the book uh, Daniel by uh, William Shea, who writes a commentary, and he had this historical section to show how thorough and ruthless these, the kingdom of Rome was. He writes, archaeology has given us an excellent example of how apt a description this is of Rome's conquest. On the west side of Jerusalem, there used to be a valley known as the Tyropenian Valley or the Cheesemakers Valley. It does not exist today because it was filled in debris because of the Roman destruction in AD 70. The Eng English archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon made a deep narrow sounding into this air and found that debris, debris was some 70 feet deep. The Romans virtually swept the site of the old site of Jerusalem clean. The Roman engineers were known for their thoroughness in both destruction and construction. In this way, this power crushed and devoured. 
This valley was found 70 feet deep. That's how thorough and ruthless these Romans were in their conquest. But again, when you read this verse, this beast was not to last forever because when you read verse 7, it tells us that this beast was diverse from all the other beasts. How so? Because... Uh, how so? Because number one, it was not likened to any animals that we know. But not only that, as you read the description, it says it was not overcome by a different beast, but rather it had 10 horns. There is this sort of a second phase to this beast. The next stage of this beast was that it had 10 horns. Now, what do horns symbolize in the Bible? When you read Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, it tells us and that the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise. The 10 horns are 10 kingdoms that will arise. And so this 10 horns, they did not appear at the beginning when Rome comes to power, verse tells us that the 10 horns are 10 kings that will arise. And so in other words, Rome was not conquered, but it was divided into 10 kingdoms, just as you, and you'll find the same principle in Daniel chapter two, where the legs, legs were made of iron and feet was made of iron and clay. And it talks about how iron and clay or do not mingle together. This kingdom will not mingle together. Stephen Haskell writes in his book, The Story of Daniel the Prophet, page 93 and 94, he writes the barbarian hordes from the north of Europe and Asia swept over the Roman Empire between the years 351 and 483 AD, crushing the government into 10 parts. What, what, what are the 10 horns? The historian Machiavel, without slighted, slightest reference to this prophecy, gives the following list of nations which occupied the territory of Western Empire at the time of the fall of Romulus Augustulus, 476 AD, the last emperor of Rome. And these are the 10 kingdoms, the Lombards, the Franks, the Burgundians, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Vandals, the Heruli, the Swaves, the Huns and the Saxons, 10 in all. Isn't it amazing, my friends, how God predicted this centuries ago before it happened. But you see, that was not it. There was this third phase to this kingdom. What was this third phase? Verse 8 tells us, while Daniel was considering, considering the yarns, behold, there came up among them this another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by their roots. So there are already 10 horns, but then an 11th horn comes up in the scene. And, when, and what happens is that when this horn comes up, three of the 10 horns that were, uh, that were before were plucked up by their roots. And it says, verse eight, it tells us that this horn, uh, uh, this horn had the eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. Who is this little horn? Now, there are at least 10 identifying marks that we find in Daniel chapter 7 that helps us identify who this little horn is. And, you know, between verses 7, 8, 19 through 21, and verses 23 through 25, there are 10 identifying marks. And we are going to go through each of them to try to understand who this little on is. It is very, very important for us to identify who this little on is because as we will see later, this little on power will rise up again. And so the first identifying mark is that this little on, it comes up out of the fourth beast. It does not come up out of the leopard. It does not come up out of the bear. It does not come up out of lion. It comes up out of this fourth beast, which is Rome. And so this kingdom, because on horns represents kingdom, as we saw in verse, uh, I think it was 20, uh, 23, no, verse 24, where it tells 10 horns out of this kingdom or 10 kings that shall arise, so king or kingdoms. So this little on kingdom will arise out of the fourth beast, which is Rome. And so this power will rise up out of 
Rome and not out of Asia or Africa or even the Middle East. The little on power comes up out of Rome. This Antichrist power, as we shall see, it exalts itself against God. It, this power will come out of Rome. Number the second identifying mark is in verse 8. You will find that it came up among the 10 horns. It comes up out of the 10 divisions of Rome. This narrows down and places us in Western Europe. The third identifying mark is that it came up after the 10 horns. So the 10 horns were already in existence when this power came. So this little one came up are up around after 430, 476 AD. We have looked at three identifying marks. Number one, it comes up out of the fourth beast. This little kingdom will come up out of Rome. Number two, it came up among the ten horns. This little, this kingdom will come up out of out of Western Europe. Number three, we saw it came up after the ten horns. This little horn, this kingdom, will come up after around 476 AD. The fourth identifying mark is in verse 8 again. It tells us that this little horn power, before whom three of the horns were plucked up, which means this power will destroy, it will be instrumental in destroying three out of the 10 kingdoms that were already in existence. The fifth identifying mark, if you read verse 20, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 20, uh, towards the end it says, whose look was more stout than his fellows, or in as other translation says, it was greater than his associates. Even though it was little in its inception, it grows up to become greater than the others. The sixth identifying mark is that verse 24. It says, this little one power, he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. He shall be diverse from the first. This power was different. Other, the other horns and the other beasts, they were political powers, but this is a political and a religious power because of the other characteristics that we'll find. It, Verse seven, I mean, the seventh character, uh, seventh identifying mark is that it has eyes like the eyes of a man and mouth speaking great words against the most high. If you'll find that in verse eight and verse 25, what does eyes represent in the Bible? In the Bible, eyes, it denotes intelligence. Bible repeatedly talks about how the eyes of God searching to and fro, 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9. Psalmist writes that, uh, he writes in Psalms 119 verse 18, open my eyes so that I may behold the wondrous things out of thy law. So eyes, eyes in Bible represents intelligence. So eyes of man denotes human intelligence over against God's wisdom. What does a mouth speaking great words represent? This little on power will speak blasphemous words against the most high God of heaven. When you look at the Bible, the two activities that define what blasphemy is when a man, when a human claims to be God and when a human claims to have power to forgive sins or take takes the prerogatives of God. In John chapter 10 and verse 33, Jesus tells, I and my father are one. And the listeners that they take stones to kill Jesus. And so Jesus asks, for which good works do you seek to kill me? But they tell him not for good works, but because you being a man claims to be God, thus speaking blasphemy. Although Jesus, even though Jesus was truly God, they did not see it. They thought a human was claimed to be God, claiming to be God, and therefore they took stones to kill Jesus. So you see that blasphemy is when a person, when a human claims to be God. And the second instance is when in Mark chapter 2 and verse 7, Jesus heals the paralytic and tells him, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees tell him, who are you? Uh, why are you speaking blasphemies, claiming power to forgive sins? And so this little on power here, it, it, it exalts human wisdom about God's wisdom. And it speaks great words against the, against the Most High, which means it will speak blasphemies. This little on power will claim to 
uh, will claim to be God and will forgive sin, sins and claim the prerogatives of God. The eighth identifying mark is we find in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. It shall wear out the saints of the Most High. It will make war on God's saints. This little on power will seek to kill the true worshipers of God. The ninth identifying mark is that it would think to change times and laws. This little on power will be bold enough to attempt to change the times and the laws of God. The tenth identifying mark is that the saints were given into his hand, verse 25. The saints were given into his hands until a time and times and the dividing of times. Now, a time in, in Bible prophecy is a year and times is plural. So two years and half a time is half a year. So this power will rule for three and a half years. Other places in the Bible it talks about the same time period in different ways such as 42 months or 1260 days. And in Bible prophecy, a day symbolizes a year. If you read Numbers verse, um, uh, uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 34, or Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, you will find that a day in a Bible prophecy, it symbolizes a year. And so 1260 days will become 1260 years. And so this little on power will rule for 1260 years. Which power fulfills, fulfills all of these characteristics. It does not have to fulfill just one. It has to fulfill all of these characteristics to be uh, so, so that we can identify who this little on power is. You see, when you look at history, my friends, there is only one power that fulfills all of these characteristics perfectly. There is only one. That is the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. Let's look at them. Let's look at all of them once again and see how it applies out of how the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, applies to this little on power. First, this little on power must ar uh, arise out of Rome. One historian, uh, he writes, when the Roman Empire had disintegrated and its place had been taken by a number of rude barbarous kingdoms, the Roman Catholic Church not only became independent of the state in religious affairs, but dominated the secular affairs as well. It's there in their name. It's the Roman Catholic Church. It arose out of Rome. Second, it arose out of the Western Europe. The Antichrist, which was to come among the ten horns, going from the small from a small power to the greatest and this indeed it is true of papacy because after its initial initial fusing with the christianity with pagan religions of the time the bishop of rome increased in power while the emperors of of the roman empire supported this roman church constantine was the first emperor to embrace christianity but he only cloaked himself with it for uh for uh, power and for just the privileges that came with it. But it was in 533 AD where Emperor Justinian, he declared that the Bishop of Rome was the spiritual leader of the Christian world. And so to qualify as a horn, this power must have attributes of a kingdom, which, in, which indeed applies to Vatican because even up till today, it is an independent state and it arose among the powers of fallen Rome. And so we see how the first two characteristics fulfill accurately to this uh, to the papacy. What was the third sign? It was to come up after the ten horns. It was to come up after 476 A.D. It was in the five thirty. It was in the year 538 A.D. that papacy had absolute power. Until then, it was opposed by other kingdoms. But it was in Five uh, year 538 AD that a decree of Emperor Justinian went into effect that assigned absolute preeminence to the Church of Rome. The fourth identifying mark we saw was that it destroyed three kingdoms. 
the papal power could not exercise absolute sovereignty until the 10 kingdoms were subjected to its control so when the kingdom when the king of herule deposed roman uh, romulus augustus in 476 ad the division of the roman empire was complete yet even though the 10 divisions of the roman empire was completed by 476 ad there were three who were rebellious and refused to submit to the bishops of Rome. The Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths, these were the Aryan powers. They were resisting the uh, resisting and they were and they refused to submit to the bishop of Rome. So these three kingdoms were destroyed by prompting by the promptings of the little one to rule over the other seven kingdoms. The Heruli, they were defeated in 493 AD, the Vandals in 534 AD, and the Ostrogoths in 538 AD. This marked the rise of the papal power. Its ruling period started in 538 AD. The fifth identifying mark was that we saw that this power, it was greater than the others. Although it was small, it was little in its inception. This power was to grow up, to become uh, greater than the others. And the little one was greater than the others. This implies that the position of their political superiority, although it began small, the little one power was to become greater than all the other powers and this was true in papacy the papacy exercised greater power than any country or kingdom countries were divided by papal decrees and kings were enthroned and dethroned by papal decrees example king charlemagne received his crown from pope in 800 a.d king henry uh, the fourth of germany stood in snow for three days to meet the pope in 1077 AD. There you see it. There you have it. This little power, this little on power, it grew to become greater. The sixth identifying mark was that it was different than the others. The papacy was diver, uh, was that was a diverse kind of power. It was different from the other political kingdoms before it because it was a religio political system, quite unlike anything the world had seen uh, before that time. Number seven, uh, this is going to take longer. Seven, it had eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. Papacy, it places human intelligence and wisdom equal and even above God. They don't believe in the Bible and Bible alone. In fact, when you look at them, their writings, they unapologetically place tradition and Bible as equal. In fact, let me read this for you. Uh, it says, sacred tradition and sacred scripture then are bound closely together and communicate one with the other. For both of them flowing out from the same divine wellspring come together in some fashion to form one thing and move towards the same goal. You see how sacred tradition and sa sacred scripture, they say it flows out from the same divine wellspring. In fact, most recently, a papal advisor has told that the Pope breaks Catholic tradition whenever he wants because he is free, free from disordered attachments. You see, the Pope, this human, they say has more power over the Bible and, and the so-called uh, sacred tradition they believe in. There you have it, where they, it has eyes of a man, where it, it places the words of man superior to the words of God. This directly fits with what the Bible has predicted. Now, does papacy claim to claim to be God and claim to forgive sins? You see, the doctrine of papal infallibility is a prime example of this. When any doctrines or points of faith are called into question, they say the Pope has the final say. That is taking the prerogatives of God. In fact, in 113 or 2 AD, Pope Boniface VIII, he proclaimed this, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. It is absolutely necessary for every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. 
friends, the Bible does not say this. The Bible tells us that whosoever believeth in the name of Jesus, they will be saved, not in Pope. In 1894 AD, Pope Leo VIII, he said this, we have constantly sought during the whole course of our pontificate and stri striven as far as it was possible by teaching and action to bind every nation and people more closely to us and make manifest everywhere the, sal the salutary influence of the sea of Rome. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. You see, ecclesiastical literature is replete with exhibits of arrogant and blasphemous claims of the papacy. You see, typical examples are the following exacts that I'm going to read for you from the large insert uh, and so encyclopedic work written by Roman Catholic divine of the 18th century. I'm going to write for you some of the things that they themselves have told. They say the Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, as it were God and the vicar of God. The Pope is crowned with three crowns as king of heaven and of earth and of lower regions. The Pope claims to be the king of heaven. That's blasphemy. The Pope, as, the Pope is, as it were, God on earth, sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief of kings, having plentitude of power to whom had been entrusted by the omnipotent God, direction not only of the earthly, but also of the heavenly kingdom. The Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even divine laws. The Pope can modify divine laws since his power is not of man, but of God. And he acts as wise gerent of God upon the earth with most ample power of binding and losing his sheep. And the last one, whatever the Lord God himself and the Redeemer is said to do, that his vicar does, provides that he does nothing contrary to the faith. And again, this is from history. There could be many more examples that I could share, but I will limit it because of time. Does the Roman Catholic Church claim power to forgive sins? They most certainly do. So you see here how this little on power, papacy, it exalts human wisdom above God's wisdom, and it claims to be God and claims to forgive sins. Papacy matches all of the seven characteristics we have seen so far. The eighth one, this papacy makes war with the saints. Historic, historian Lecky, he says, the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind. Does this fit the prophecy that we saw? Absolutely, it does. Ninth, this papacy would think to change, uh, would think to change times and laws. When you look at the Catholic Catechism, it shows that the papacy has tried to change the law of God. The Ten Commandments has been tampered with. The Second Commandment, which re refers to images and idols, is absent in Catholic literature. And to make up for the loss of one commandment, the Tenth Commandment is divided into two. The Fourth Commandment, which talks about Sabbath, becomes the third in the Catholic Catechism. The day of worship is shifted by papal degree from Saturday to Sunday. Then the Tenth Commandment has been split into two, to have 10. And this is one of the more se most serious works of papacy to change God's law. In fact, listen to what they themselves have said. It says, there is no mention of the cessation of Sabbath and the institution of Sunday in the Gospels or in Paul's writing or in all the Bible. Therefore, this has taken place by the apostolic church instituting it without scripture. Now, there are many people who today go to the Bible, who look to the writings of Paul to try to say that, you know, the uh, sacredness of Sabbath has ended and we are to keep Sunday, but it is nowhere to be found in the Bible. Even the Catholics themselves, they admit it. In fact, in another reference, they say the Bible says, remember that thou keep this Keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the 
first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Anyone who worships on the Saturday, on, on Sunday instead of Sabbath day, they are bowing down in reverence, reverent obedience to the Catholic Church. That's what they claim. There are many other sources which show that the Catholic Church has changed the Sabbath day which the Christian world today follow, the papers he had taught to change the law, but unsuccessfully, because God's law, it cannot be changed. There will be a faithful few who will keep the true commandments of God, the true Sabbath. Now, I'm not saying that everyone who worships on Sunday or bowing down to Catholic Church, there are many who do not know the truths of the Sabbath. Therefore, they're not bowing down to the Catholic Church. But it is one, when one makes a conscious decision to worship on Sunday, even though when they know that Sabbath is the true day of God, that is when they are worshiping to the Catholic Church and not to the true God of heaven. Just wanted to clarify that. And finally, the tenth sign we saw was that the saints were given into the hands of papacy for a time, times, and half a time, which we already saw was 1,260 days, which are years, according to Bible prophecy. We already saw how in 538 AD, Emperor Justinian destroyed the Ostrogoths, the last rebellious tribe, to give absolute power to the Roman church. 1,260 years from 538 AD brings us to 15. 1798 AD and what happened during on that year the french general berthier he marched marched in his armies into rome and pulled the pope off his throne he was carried away into exile and all the properties of the church were con con uh, conf uh, confiscated in fact my friends look the prophecy is very very precise 1260 years exactly from 539 leads us to 1798 where the uh, 1798 uh, AD where exactly the French general Berthier under the command of Napoleon he comes and captures the Pope and and he gives this deadly wound in fact, when you look at another places in the Bible, this is actually described as the deadly wound. But you may think, why are we studying over this little one that ruled in the past, right? You know, 1798, it ruled for 1798, which ended in 17, uh, it ruled for 1260 years, which ended in 1798. And so you might be questioning, why do I, why do I have to worry? Because it's already passed. But friends, we need to understand that this little on power is on the rise and as it is predicted in Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation chapter 13, this little on power is described with a different beast. And there we see that this beast which received the deadly wound will resurrect and that the deadly wound will be healed. You see, this power not only wages war against the people of God, but against God himself. It will persecute the people of God. It will think to change times and laws. When we talk of, about the, and so when we talk about the Roman Catholic Church, we are talking about the system, not the people. We are talking about this uh, papal system. That is what we are talking about. This system wages war against God and his people. It wages war, war against God and his people. But the question is, will God allow this oppressive power to continue forever? How long will this power rule? You know, we saw how earlier, we saw how um, most of the portions of Daniel 7 was given to this fourth beast. And we concluded how that, uh, that, that was one of the most central portions of this prophecy. You'll find that from verses 9 through 14, verses 8, verses 22 and verse 26 and 27 talks about this one particular event and that forms the theme of this chapter what does what happens here what does god do in response to this oppressive power daniel chapter 7 verses 9 and 10 daniel chapter 7 verses 9 and 10 and this is what it says I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garments was white as snow and the hair of his head like 
pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. You see, as Daniel sees in the vision, as he sees this little on power waging war against the people of God, Daniel sees and the thrones were cast down. The ancient of days, he comes and he sits and thousands and thousands were ministering to the ancient of days. Who is this ancient of days? Psalms 90 and, 90 and verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or even uh, even thou hadst formed the earth and the world, and and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Ancient of days, it refers to the it refers to God, the Father, and the thousands and thousands who are ministering to Him are the angels, as you read in Hebrews chapter one and verse fourteen. But where is the throne of God? Is the throne of God set up on this earth? No, it is in heaven, as you can see in Revelation 4, where it talks about the throne, where John, the revelator, he's given this throne room vision. And so where is this judgment happening? And where are the books that were open? Because it says in verse 10, the judgment was set and the books were open. Where is this taking place? It is taking place in heaven. What is this judgment about? What are those books? We will study about this aspect in our next uh, presentation because as I mentioned earlier, this whole thing is repeated in Daniel 8 as the sanctuary being cleansed. So what will happen as a result of this judgment? What happens to this beast which oppresses the people of God and, oppress and uh, stands up against God himself? Daniel chapter 7 and verse 11, it says, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the Orn spoke. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Now Daniel sees a, a different scene and he sees that this beast was slain. His kingdom, his body was destroyed and was given to the burning flame. In fact, verse 26 talks about the same event it says but the judgments shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end you see when the judgment sits the dominion of this beast will be taken away this beast will be annihilated and it will be destroyed what does verse 12 says as concerning the rest of the beasts they had their dominion taken away yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time what does this mean? The other beasts, oh, uh, their lives were prolonged even though their dominion was taken away. In other words, when Medo-Persia conquered Babylon, the, they allowed the subjects to live on the same with Greece and Rome. But in contrast, when this beast, when the dominion of this beast was taken away, it will be completely destroyed. What happens next? Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the people, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. My friends, the son of man here, it represents Jesus. He comes and he receives the dominion, the glory and the kingdom from the father. This happens at the conclusion of the judgment. He sets up, Jesus will come and he will set up his everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom shall not be destroyed you see my friends even though evil may reign long even though evil will persecute god's people even though evil may seem to change the laws of god and deceive people the bible promises that god is in control and that he will come to set up his everlasting kingdom just as how all these predictions came to pass the coming of christ and the setting up of his kingdom will come to pass in absolute certainty the end is nearer than we think you know as i was thinking about thinking and praying about this pre presentation 
I was reminded by, uh, reminded of this poem written in 1844 by James Russell Lowell titled The Present Crisis. There are several lines that are so powerful. This is what it says. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown, standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. Truth may be all on the scaffold. A scaffold was a stage or an elevated platform for the execution of a criminal. Over the centuries, many faithful people of God were executed on a scaffold. And so the author, he writes, truth may be on the scaffold. Truth forever, it may seem like forever it's on the scaffold. And wrong may be forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future because behind the dim unknown, God stands within the shadows, keeping watch over his own. Throughout history, we may question, why did God allow his people to be persecuted? Why did God do this? Why did not God do this? But we need to learn that we need to learn to trust that behind the dim unknown stands God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. God is in the shadows, but there will come a time where God will reveal himself. He will come and set up his kingdom. Even in Daniel chapter 7, we find God working behind the scenes. For example, if you go to Daniel chapter 7, we are going to end with this. Daniel chapter 7, it says, you know, this lion, it had eagle's wings, and he says, I beheld things uh, till the wings thereof were plucked who plucked them it was it were in it continues it saying it was it was lifted up from the earth and made made to stand up on the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it who gave man's heart to this beast verse 5 it says uh, towards the end it says they said unto they said thus unto it arise devour much flesh who is the they here Verse 6, uh, and dominion was given to it. Who gave Greece the dominion? Verse 9 through 14, as we read, we find that it is God who has authority, even though the little on power tries to usurp it. You see, friends, behind all of this, God is orchestrating the events of history towards one glorious climax. The beauty of all of this is that we know who wins the battle. It is Jesus. But the choice is ours today. Are we going to choose to be on his side? The greatest irony will be if we knowing who is going to win and choose to be on the losing side. Friends, let us surrender and give our lives to Jesus so we can be ready to meet him when he comes. And always remember this, that behind the dim unknown, God is standing, watching over his own. And even in your personal life, it may seem like God is not present, but remember that behind the dim unknown, God is in the shadows and he is watching over you and he will act when the time for him uh, when the time for him to act comes. And so let us keep trusting in God and let us be watchful and be ready and let us not be overswayed by the uh, deceptions of the enemy, but let us cling to the truth and wait for God to act. Let us pray. I Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we covered over many things and there may be many things that uh, many of us uh, may not completely understand, but Father, I pray that you would please give, give us your Holy Spirit so we can understand as we study this chapters more, as we go over the next presentations. I pray, Father, that your truth will become clearer to all the participants who are listening to this. May, and I pray, Father, that they, they would heed to the voice of the Holy Spirit talking to them. And God, I pray that we would trust you and that even though you may be in shadows, we know that you will come and act one day. Father, we know that you will come and set up your kingdom, your everlasting kingdom. Father, please prepare us for that event. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.